Culture. Culture is now drinking out of the bottle. Although I don't know how cultural it is to drink Meselweise out of a Warsteiner mug. I was always terrible at pouring. I worked at uh, several bar-like locations, but I think I've got this. I've got this pretty good. Right. So some might take me and my love of flags to think that I am some kind of a, a crazy guy that leans a little too far to the right. That is not the case. I believe in nation states. I believe that they are not necessarily racial in nature, uh, although there is generally a specific ethnic population that lives in an area and sort of provides the background local color to it. Uh, for instance, the Irish have made jigs, and I'm a Russian <laughs> that loves German beer that plays Irish jigs. I'm not very good at playing Irish chicks, but nonetheless, I have been enriched by all of these various cultures. And I believe that these various cultures have a right to assert themselves and their history with a confidence and a satisfaction, if not necessarily a pride. And that is what it means to kind of live in a multicultural context. Multicultural does not mean that we erase all our cultures into a homogenized sort of weird uh, stew, it means that we allow the cultures to coexist as the colorful and robust things that they are. And I just wanted to make that point. There's, there's been lots of ways that I've thought of making it, but I just decided to do a, a faggy little, little talent show because my, my, my ability to communicate these ideas is severely compromised by my lack of time. And so far, the best I can do is these vlogs. But hopefully, that's, that's making some, some sense. So, well, all that out of the way, welcome to TFS number 10. The Fractal Standard is the daily variety show that's an offshoot off my main website, thefractaljournal.com, where you'll find stories, ideas, shitty webcomics, and more. Prost. Now, we were talking about languages in a couple of these videos, and so here I have some books. One is a French dictionary from when I took French way back in the ancient days. One is Encyclopédie de l'Editier, uh, which is uh, a book my grandmother gave me, or my mother may have sent me, from Russia, which is an encyclopedia for children, and that's about the level that I read at. But... You see, English and German are actually very highly related. Um, so this is the back of a book about Berlin. I picked up from a, a bookstore that my friend runs, and he gets all kinds of oddities in there. And I don't speak German. I've, you know, I like German music, so I've explored the language. I also like the German philosophers like Nietzsche, but I don't speak German. But even besides that, with the very few German words I know... I think I can at least understand some of this, which is Bernd Engelmann schreibt die Geschichte Berlins faktenreich und detailliert und immer aus der Sicht der Menschen, die in dieser Stadt gelebt haben und ihr Geschick beeinflussten. So that's Bernd Engelmann, the author, writes die Geschichte Berlins, the story of Berlin, faktenreich 
So how hard is that? Fact rich or factually rich? Und detailliert, detailliert, detailed, und immer aus der Sicht der Menschen. Now, I don't know what that part means, but I think it's something along the lines of and ever and immer aus, out the view of mankind. Die in dieser Stadt and in this city gelebt haben und ihr had lived und ihr Geschick beeinflussten. I'm, sure, I'm not sure if Geschick means sent or what, but anyway, there's just commonalities as well as in the structure of the sentences. There's a little bit of, of moving around, but it's not the difference, the pronounced difference between that and the language I actually know, which is Russian. So let's see. This is just a random page I open to. Russia, strana asiatskaya ili evropeskaya. So Russia, a country that is Asian or European. Ответ на этот вопрос зависит от того, что обсуждается. Территория или население. So the answer to this depends on what is trying to be decided. Uh, the uh, the population or the territory. So, ответ на этот вопрос, answer on this question, зависит, depends от того, on this, что обсуждается, what's under discussion, обсуждается, территория или население. And it's just kind of a, a very different cadence, a very different flow. I think that there's a a cadence in English and German that is very similar because English is a Germanic language, I think, with some, you know, Latin influences from French, and then I'm sure there's there's Gaelic and, and Celtic words in there. But yeah, I don't remember shit about French, but I just I like I like their I like their sense of insouciance. Anyhow. Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky. And some guy with the last name Herman. Written a year before I was born, in 1988. And talking about the propaganda model, which the propaganda model has to do with kind of how information is disseminated from the large entities of mass media communications and how, not even necessarily through any kind of design, it comes out of... Uh, it, it basically, uh, propaganda comes out of common interests of the entities involved. And this idea has been supported by scholars and people who have looked at it over the ages. One of the tenets of the uh, propaganda model is flack, and not flack in like flack journalism, but flack as in, uh, you know, using uh, your, your power and position in society to promote negative news stories uh, about an enemy and uh, things of that nature. And uh, creating an enemy is actually very, very powerful. And that's what keeps on being repeated over and over again. And the more nebulous and shadowy the enemy, uh, the more uh, robust the propaganda because you can kind of make every shadow terrifying. So it used to be communism originally. And then, you know, after 2001 happened, Noam Chomsky included, you know, terrorism and the war on terror as the big kind of boogeyman scare. And now, interestingly enough, it's coming around full circle to being the fear of, of Russia and Russian people, um, which is really annoying that this kind of politic seems to work very, very well, despite us knowing exactly what's going on that's why as i watch the news and i talk to people and i have friends that you know when say bush was doing something that was blatantly like out of a propaganda playbook they'd see right through it and then obama got into office who i voted for by the way and when he started doing the same kind of shit they kind of swept it all aside so despite knowing all these facts despite having discussed them party interest took over and i just think that's uh <laughs> really shitty now, I think that I'm kind of a cautious optimist in that I think that things will eventually tend to work themselves out. People are aware of, of their biases and when, when they're being kind of shitty. 
Uh, but still, in, in the process of all of this, there's just a lot of wasted time and potential for for friendly relations, not only between nations, but uh, the people within those nations of various political stripes and parties, just because everything becomes so polarized due not only to just a propaganda model convergence of these interests, but because that this kind of polarization plays into human nature of uh, taking sides and defending tribe very well. Uh, yeah. So I'm a douche, so I have to look at my own notes where I was planning to talk about because I've got a lot of stuff. So earlier today, I was working on a little song about the Saracens. Not really. It's actually called Samarkand, which is in Uzbekistan. But uh, I think it was one of the stops along the Silk Road. And so I was in kind of like a, a mystical mood playing stuff that sounds vaguely oriental. God damn you, Augustine. You schismatic heretic, you. So... And song along to it, but I was just I started playing that, and I thought it sounded Oriental, and uh, I know it's just really really fun. But Saracens apparently was just a, a term that's meant several different things, from referring to a specific group of kind of uh, near and Middle Eastern people to just referring to Muslims in general. Uh, and I think it was used a lot by, by crusaders. So it lends itself well to kind of an, an air of, of, of mystery and ancientness. And uh, I find that sort of thing fun. Unlike this terrible lighting situation I have going on. So what are Bohemians? Well, uh, I think that Bohemia is like a kingdom in the Czech Republic. I've uh, dated a couple of girls of Czech descent, so I'm a fan, but Bohemians are kind of artistic types. I think Mark Twain considered himself uh, a Bohemian, and basically it's the starving artist stereotype, but there's a, a lot of very interesting history there, which, yeah, flappers all that stuff. And the sorts of things that flappers would talk about are questions like, are cars sustainable? See, whenever I drive on the road, I'm always like, look at the amount of steel and tires and material and stuff that's on there. And I'm impressed. I'm a fan. I think that's a, that's a great thing. But at the same time, and not just because I'm an environmentalist, but at the same time, it's like, dude, holy shit, how are we going to be able to keep this up? <laughs> And if we're not, what are we going to do when we can't? What are we going to do with all these freeways? Are we going to somehow adapt all this work that we've already done into some kind of other use? Or what's what's going to happen? What's going on? And, uh, you know, these are the sorts of questions that we would actually ask in my environmental science class back when I had a really cool teacher. Uh, and one of the things he had us do was was make, like, hypothetical cities. Of course, mine were like, uh, I just plagiarized Venice, and I'm like, we're just going to have canals and use you know, use water to move people around. But yeah, I mean, I, I really doubt that in, in any time in the near future, we're going to run into this problem, but it's probably going to become, you know, like the middle class kind of lifestyle that I have is going to become increasingly more difficult as the population grows and demands grow and technology is not able to keep up with that demand. And so then we're probably going to have to start changing behaviors. Or maybe not. Or maybe maybe we just need to focus on newer and better technologies. And like I was saying, f uh, figure out what, what else to do with the roads. Because you don't want to, you don't want to waste all that, all that effort that we've already, we've already done. Yeah, I'm just kind of off the cuff philosophizing today. Um, so I, I stumbled across an interesting article 
that's one of the ways I pick topics for the show. Just pocket is a is a recommendation thing via Firefox. One of the articles they had up there was about scientists have proposed a new theory on why we haven't found aliens yet, and it's because they're sleeping. I'm like holy shit! So you're telling me that Cthulhu is real? That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons, death may die. No, there's something called aestivating, which is kind of like hibernating, but instead of doing it during the cold months, organisms do it during the warm months. And what they were saying is that a highly advanced civilization from billions of miles away would probably have downloaded themselves onto like a, a computer or something and are just out there floating dormant in as cold a region of space as possible in order to make these computers run. So that is super fucking sci-fi. And the guys that came up with it, they were like, yeah. Most likely not, but we're we're part of a think tank made to fucking think this shit up. This is me. This latter part is me extrapolating it. So we just went we just went with this idea, and it's a cool idea for a friggin' novel. So hey, uh, I mean, I I, I uh, primarily blog and see most of my traffic on WordPress. So all you authors out there, you know, start uh, writing writing books. Maybe maybe call it estivating, which I, I thought it was a very interesting word. Now, I want to talk about the boredom barrier. So, you know, we have experts in things, and everybody always kind of is like, oh my gosh, this person is an expert. They know so much, and they must have become an expert because they're very, very smart. Well, statistically speaking, they're going to be average or slightly above average. There's not that many fucking geniuses out there. And I, what the hell does intelligence mean anyway? You know, come at me, IQists, come at me. But <laughs> I think that a lot of a lot of where where people gain the upper hand, where they can use the propaganda model, is the boredom barrier. Because a lot of this information is really, really boring and painstaking to sift through. And someone that has, you know, a surface understanding of it can make it seem like they're an authoritative source. And you're never going to go in there and fucking check up on it. And that's why we find ourselves in the goddamn pickles that we do. Because when the, when the nerd starts screaming, wait a minute, this guy is lying... You're not going to pay attention because the guy that's lying has a nice suit and he's on CNN, right? All right. 20 minutes. I almost fucking did it. But I'm going to sign off now. Man website, franklinjournal.com. If you like this video, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. Cheers.